Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. We're back in the book of Genesis. This is the last chapter in the book of Genesis. We've been going through Genesis for the last year and two months. All right, we're in chapter 50. We've been looking at the life of Joseph for the last uh, 25%, last 13 chapters of Genesis, and we've been seeing how he reflects and pre-reflects, actually, Jesus before he comes and how a lot of his life was in keeping with the Lord. So, if you remember last week, we were in chapter 49, where Jacob blesses all of his sons, and it was a very involved passage in which I'm sure I didn't do it justice and kind of went over it, and how each one of those blessings is a prophecy about the future. In fact, Jacob says, you know, come in and let me, let me tell you what's going to happen in the end times. And it's one of the most fascinating chapters of prophecy as you go through it. And Jacob announces it as such. And so he brings his sons in to bless them. If you remember chapter 48, he had Joseph's sons and he adopted them as his own to be put in along with the others. And he reverses his hands to give the younger, the bigger blessing. And uh, Joseph tries to stop him, but uh, he says, no, I know what I'm doing. I know I'm old and blind, but I know what I'm doing. And so he goes on and blesses the younger over the older. And we saw how God likes to do that. He intervenes and changes our culture, our expectations, and what we think we're going to do. Any of you ever have the Lord change your plan dramatically? Okay, three of you. Okay, well, it's coming. It's coming then. It's, and so he... He brings his sons in and he gathers them together and he says, I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going to befall in the, in the end times, which is a rather interesting thing. It's just a flat out announcement that there's, this is a prophecy. And it's interesting as you look through because it's not really a whole lot of blessing, uh, especially with Reuben. He starts out with Reuben. Uh, the only thing he's got going for him is a sandwich was named after him uh, because he's the firstborn. And the firstborn, unfortunately, he got into some sexual immorality with his stepmom, and that kind of ruined everything, um, at least one of his four wives, Jacob's wives. And so it wasn't such a pleasant thing, and he embarrassed him, I would imagine, before all of his brothers. It's like, okay, I'm the oldest. What do I get when you die? Well, uh, you're a disappointment. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a difficult thing to deal with. But we also see that Israel reflects that the nation itself, one of the very first things they did once they get free of their 400 years of bondage is they, they entered into sexual morality while Moses was up on the, the mountain. And so we do see that he is prophesying of not just of Reuben and what occurred with him, but what would happen in the future with the people of Israel. And so he moved on to all of the other sons one at a time. He talked of two on one. He did Simon and Levi, if you remember, or Simeon and Levi, the, how they were uh, just ruthless guys. And they went in and killed an entire city of men under the guise of following a religious um, observance of circumcision. Went in and he goes, you guys are ruthless and divided. And we see that that ends up happening with Israel as Israel gets divided into two northern and southern kingdoms and they get taken over by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So we, we got to see that last week and went into it. Judah gets a lot of ink because Judah, although he has his faults, he becomes the, the line in which the Messiah comes through. And all of this prophecy about Judah being a lion and a lion's whelp, and he goes through this whole thing, and the scepter would not depart from Israel until uh, Shiloh comes. And that prophecy, which is so deep and so intricate, and we got to see how Jesus Christ came at the very time that they finally lost the ability to, in, uh, to enforce their laws, at least the one uh, with the death penalty. And so the, the rabbis weeping and saying that the scripture has been broken, uh, and it wasn't because there was a young man who was working in his father's shop who was Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. In fact, it says that when he was that age that he was in the temple teaching and how the teachers were amazed at how much he knew about the scriptures. So we looked at some of those things, and uh, they're not coincidences, and they are prophecy as we go through. 
So he talks of him as a leader, as a lion, as Lord, and as the landowner in all of those terms. And when we see that Jesus fulfills all of that as he brings salvation to us, all of the language in the book of Revelation, speaking of Jesus as the lion of Judah and also a lamb that was slain and how his eyes were like fire and all of these things that were involved in this prophecy, Jesus actually fulfills. We also saw Zebulun and how he would just take off and disappear. You saw Zebulun was one of these uh, smaller tribes that sits inside of Asher on the border of these things between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean and how they essentially got scattered. They jumped in ships and went over the sea and how that happens. We saw that the same thing happened with Israel as well and how they were scattered throughout the world and persecution will do that. With Issachar, that he would be exploited and we see that um, we, we know of Nazi Germany especially, but also in Russia, the, the Jews especially were fingered and said, you guys aren't worthy to stay alive. And in the programs and in, um, and in the concentration camps, assassinated the Jews. You, you have to see it as a satanic ploy, right? I mean, why the Jews? And yet there are persecuted people as they wander through and the, the, the bizarre thing is without this event, without this hardship and without the world seeing what had happened to these poor people as a group, we never would have Israel. Israel, the world had compassion on the Jews and said, we got to do something for these guys and gave them back the land that God gave them a long time ago. And so we got to see how God used that anyway. We see Dan gets a prophecy as well. Although it, it refers to him as an asp and a serpent and uh, how a writer's going to fall back on and all of that language sounds incredibly negative. And there are lots of rabbis who believe that the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. And there, there are other passages that would uh, explain that. If you get to Revelation chapter 7, how the tribe of Dan is not included in the readout of the 144,000. Their tribe is just missing conspicuously. And so you have to wonder how do all these things fit together in prophecy? And Gad is a troop, and he would be persecuted. And we see that certainly the Jews went through persecution in, in, their, um, in their journey and in their spreading out throughout the world. Asher means happy, and he would be protected, and that the Lord would keep, and he would save a remnant, those that are his, uh, and which he does. And Jesus says, when you see these things occur in Jerusalem, when you see all the troops gather around, make sure you don't come down and pack a bag and go inside, but you get out and you go and go into the, uh, the rock cliffs. Naphtali means wrestling. And he talks about how they have beautiful words and how they're like a deer that's let loose. And uh, this is speaking of these uh, 144,000 evangelists that are in the book of Revelation that will, um, they're going to be martyred for what they speak of as they try to reason with Israel in the end times. We see Joseph, he also has a lot of ink or a lot of words from his father, and he's being blessed by his dad, and he's a symbol of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. After all of this, uh, we basically blow everything up, and the Lord comes and takes his people home, and he restarts everything. We know that Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and then he's going to be allowed to be let loose again. Some of you ever wonder why that is? No. Okay, that's good. I don't have to explain it then. I wonder why it doesn't just kick him off right now. But God has a purpose, doesn't he? And, and if he were to come back right this very second, who would not get to accept Christ? Maybe a friend, maybe a relative, maybe somebody that you care about deeply won't come to the place where they surrender their life to the Lord. So uh, I pray, Lord, come quickly, and he's going to come in his own time, but I want to make sure that I'm doing my part. And then we see Benjamin, who is this uh, victorious remnant. At, at the very end, we, we see that not all of Israel is lost. God's promises are not forgotten, and Israel will come to know the, their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we see Jacob dies. He finally breathes his last. That's a rather interesting thing. It says he draws his feet up into the bed because he was blessing these boys. He drew his feet up into the bed, those feet that had wandered, those feet that had run, those feet that he was running away from his brother, 
those feet that went and uh, everywhere he went and he learned how to uh, not be deceitful because he ran into Laban. He drew his feet up into his bed and I imagine he just took one last breath and that was it. And he let himself go. And so we get to see Jacob, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel, finally dies and expires. So today only, because I don't know that we'll be back this way again, we're in chapter 50, the burial of Jacob. Picking it up in verse 1, chapter 50. And Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. And so here, here's his funeral. And even though they're in Egypt, and even though the, these are the outsiders, he spent 17 years there. He's very, very honored in fact, if you remember when he first meets Pharaoh, he ends up blessing Pharaoh. Uh, this guy can't go anywhere without blessing somebody, which is, boy, I wish that could be said of all of us, right? I, I, th I think of the affection and how he wept on his father. It says, the affection and sense of loss experienced at a loved one's passing is human and needful to digest loss and brokenness. Without this outpouring of our soul, it tends to twist and we find outlets that are less genuine and even harmful. I was thinking about um, the death of my brother, my youngest brother, who got hit by several cars consecutively and died. I thought about my mom, who just recently died last year. I think about my dad, who died before that, and uh, my in-laws, who I love dearly, and all of the people in our lives, even here at church, like our brother Mark Mokarski. Um, and, and so many others, uh, David Krauser. And I started thinking about all of that. And, you know, there are some people that just don't cry. That kind of concerns me. <laughs> like, if I don't cry, if I don't feel something deeply, I have to wonder, am I a sociopath? <laughs> Do you ever feel that way? I, like, this really doesn't move me. I'm not touched. And maybe I should be. And we see Joseph, by the way, this is the, this is the sixth time, if you're counting, that Joseph breaks down in tears and he weeps. He's got one more that's going to be coming here today. But he weeps over his father. And for us to process that sort of sorrow is natural and human and right. And if you don't process it that way, there are other very less helpful ways to process that, right? Like, Let's go get drunk and beat somebody up. That's what I used to do. Um, or go get stoned and just check out. Or take it out on somebody else. Or just uh, disappear and do some other self-harm. Isn't it weird how everybody tends to mourn in different ways? And here Joseph did something which was very natural, very heartfelt, very loving, and very understandable. What happens when you suppress that or you, you just drive it down? I don't know if you were one of those little boys or little girls where your parents said, hey, cut that out. Don't cry. Why do we do that? <laughs> why do we tell our children or our grandchildren, why do we tell them to not cry? Now, I can understand if you're in the middle of the store and they want a bag of lollipops and you're not giving it to them. That's when you tell them to stop crying because they're just being disobedient and manipulative. But there are reasons why we should be broken. There are reasons we should be hurting deeply. And that's going to be revealed uh, in, in everything that we do and in, in our heart breaking. Although nobody likes to do that and people are very self-conscious about expressing that, it's very natural and it's healthy. Because if we don't, the other possibilities, I think, are endless as to how we can do damage. Or just shut that part of you off. Any of you grow up with, you know, the big boy, big boys don't cry thing? Anybody ever tell you that? Okay. Big girls don't cry? Anybody been told that too? Yeah. Okay. Nobody. All right. So 
I always felt like I, sh I shouldn't cry because that's kind of being vulnerable and mushy and open and that's not what a man does. And yet when I look at Jesus and I see he weeps, and when I see Joseph and I see he weeps over and over and over, uh, I see Jacob when he finds his son and he weeps on him for a long time. When I see that, I see it's a natural, healthy part of what it is to have a heart. Uh, if not, maybe you've got to go see the wizard. <laughs> In Psalm 39, 4, it says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. It's a Psalm of David. Help me to know the end of my days. And how frail I am. That sounds like an unusual prayer, doesn't it? It's important to remember that our life is but a vapor that's here for a moment and then it's gone. It's good to think about these things. It's, it's not enjoyable. It's not like, woohoo, it's Labor Day. You know, it's not like one of those things. But it becomes very helpful. It becomes profitable, fruitful. Psalm 90, which uh, you may know is uh, the only one that Moses wrote. Psalm 90 says, we finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. I find it interesting that Psalm 90 was written by Moses and he lived to be 120. So that whole 80, you know, 70 to 80 thing didn't apply to him. In fact, he went another 40 years after that. I think it's because the Lord had plans for him. You know, if you're busy and the Lord has plans for you, you can't die. You're impervious. Which is why I leave everything half done. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 7 it's a little like we're at a funeral here today. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by a sad countenance, a heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You know, when people go to a bar... They go there to forget about their life. When people go to a funeral, they remember what life means. And I think that's what he's saying. It's one of my favorite passages. I'm sure I mentioned it before, but in case you haven't heard it, there you go. So they're mourning the death of Jacob. 72 days was the length of time that Egypt would mourn for a pharaoh, by the way. And the length of time that people would, would mourn shows how much that person is respected or valued. And so they mourn for him for 70 days. Now, as an outsider, I think that's an amazing thing because it shows how much they valued him and how much they respected him, even though he was an outsider. And he'd only been with them for 17 years. And so the deep respect that they showed Jacob was because of his connection with Joseph. I think that's remarkable. They didn't really know Jacob very well. They didn't know his story like we know his story. They didn't see all of the times that he messed up and all of his misspeakings. They didn't know all of that, but they did know he was connected to Joseph, and that's all that mattered to them. I wonder if people treat you with that respect because you know Jesus. But I digress. And it says they embalmed him. Do you find that unusual that a Jewish man was embalmed in the style of Egyptian bombing and, and bombing it, I, I read about this process which is interesting uh, the ritual of embalming it, there's a papyrus and Herodotus actually wrote of it uh, he ended up going to uh, like a reporter <laughs> he went into Egypt and actually inquired do you know how they do that it's it's not like when you go to a funeral home now and somebody takes care of it they they lay you out on a slab and through the nose, they pull your brain out a piece at a time because, you know, your brain's bigger than your nose cavity. And they literally empty your head of that. Then they make an incision and they take out all your organs. They may put them into separate jars or ossuaries, or they may just clean them and put them back in. But then they stuff you with spices 
and uh, tree sap and, and uh, other stuff that's like a salt solution. I'll, I'll spare you uh, all of the details. But they let you soak for 40 days in this salt solution, like a pickle, after you're sewn up and everything's been washed. And they basically dehydrate you like, like you dehydrate fruit. And they take all the moisture out because... Uh, and they fill you with cinnamon, and there's a whole thing. Uh, there's frankincense, which is involved. And Anyway, I won't get into it because it's disgusting, but I'm, I'm wrestling with telling you, though. <laughs> so they embalm him, and they're mourning for him all along, and they, they mourn for him along with all of these days. And I just think it's an absolute amazing thing. Now, you remember what Jacob said to Joseph. Yeah. Don't leave me here. Don't leave me here. Make sure you take my bones home. Right? That's exactly what he said. So, but make sure you take me home because this is the place that God has said that we would be and I don't want my bones here. I want my bones there. So he left word, which is kind of neat. So 70 days, they mourned for him. And now when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, so he's sending a messenger, my father made me swear, saying, behold, I am dying. And in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father, as he has made you swear. And so Joseph went up to bury his father, with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And so they're going for a funeral, but it's a, it's a destination funeral. And so they're going away to Canaan to bury their father. And so everybody goes. I don't know if you have... Uh, if you're old enough to remember the funeral procession of JFK, our president, when he was shot. I was a very young man, and still am. But, I, but I've, I've uh, gotten to see photographs that are very memorable and of when he was um, taken, and he had a state funeral. I imagine it was very similar to that. Uh, or if you guys remember when Princess Diana died, you might remember the procession and everyone, all of the, the majesty that surrounded that funeral and how everybody was there. That's a little bit like what happened. And, but you have all of the people of Egypt actually going out as well, the elders, uh, the people, the statesmen, those who are important. And so um, those are some pictures from Diana's procession and funeral. And that's what it was like for Jacob as they went away. I find it interesting that he, they left their children in Egypt, uh, I, I think maybe Pharaoh wanted to hold on to something to make sure Joseph was coming back because I'm sure he heard the rumors and, the, and uh, all of the talk from Joseph that God had promised them the land of Canaan. That's their promised land, and that's why he's taking them back there to bury him. So uh, it's interesting. They, it's almost like he's saying, it's okay, I'll hold on to your kids. We'll watch them. Make sure you come back. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. We're talking about out loud weeping. He observed seven days of mourning for his father, and then the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, and they said, this is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. It's interesting. They didn't even recognize them as the Jews. Therefore, its name is called Abel Mazrim, which is beyond the Jordan, which means the weeping of Egypt. It's the, the mourning of Egypt. The last word that you might have to others in this life may be your funeral. Isn't that interesting? Most people think, you know, oh, I, you know, I wasn't able to see my father when he died. He, he didn't, his last words, I didn't quite get. Well, you know, those things get said at the funeral. So, 
if those things are important to you, you should probably get that thing ready. Right? If I were to die, my wife would have no idea what to do. But you know what I told her? Do whatever you want. <laughs> I know where I'm going. And I'm good. And then you have people that say, oh, I'm going to make sure they do this. I need these 17 songs sung. Yeah. And uh, it needs to be sung by, you know, Elton John. And, you know, like there, there are people that get very specific and very, very, you know, poignant about what they want. But I, I just told my wife, do whatever you want. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill. Yes, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's, there are times for all of this and to think that there, there's one of those things on that list that should get taken out of there uh, isn't life. And somebody that tells you that isn't telling you the truth. They're trying to sell you something. And so... His sons did for him just as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field of, from the field of Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial service or burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. So nobody sticks around after this putting him in the ground and planting him, so to speak, in the cave, they all come back. It's interesting because today we had communion. We remembered the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's a memorial of sorts. So it's like remembering his death. It's like a funeral or a memorial. And we do that on a monthly basis. We do that the first Sunday of the month. Uh, you, you guys did a great job with it, by the way. We appreciated it. And it's a time for us to reflect and think about the cost of our souls, which were purchased by Christ. I think it's good to observe those things. And um, if you die, maybe you don't want a memorial service, but I imagine the people that are left behind might. They might want to remember you. Surprising as that might be for you. They might want to talk about you. They might want to digest various aspects of your life. They might want to do that. And so maybe you don't want any fuss, but I can tell you sometimes that doesn't help people mourn. I'm just saying. And so we remember Jesus. In fact, he said, every time you take this cup and eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. It's, it's not a, a, a magic show or some kind of a special element that adds magic to your body. It's something that spiritually should affect us as we think about what Jesus did. Because he was one who died for us. And we want to remember him. Amen? And I think there's something to be said about a proper burial. And he was put into the cave, much like Jesus was put into the cave. But Jesus just had a rented cave. He wasn't going to use it more than three days. So Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. And they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us. And he may actually repay us for the evil in which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Guys, that's a lie. Dad didn't leave them any word. He didn't say, hey, listen, when I'm dead, make sure you tell Joseph. Like, he could have told Joseph himself, right? I always, 
I always find it less than appreciative when somebody tells me that God has been trying to get in touch with me, but I don't answer his phone calls. And so God told them that I should do something. I, I, I'm, I'm, you smell that? It smells like... No, never mind. So they're lying to him because they're afraid. Suddenly dad's out of the picture. They think dad was the only reason that Joseph was being kind to them because their father was still alive. But Joseph spoke any number of times to these guys, showing them forgiveness and love and having fellowship with them in a way that they never had before. And they still don't trust him. Why? It's something a bit more than guilt. It's shame. It's not something they did. It's someone they are. You see, they haven't separated the deed from who they are. And they're still worried. I wonder, how many of you have doubted your salvation at some point in time? Do you doubt? Okay. All right. So you can understand why they would feel this way. Isn't it interesting? And so Joseph weeps. Why do you think he wept? I can't believe these guys. They still think that I have it in for them. Have I not shown love? Have I not gone the second mile? Have I not turned the other cheek? Have I not? What have I not done? I mean, don't you feel like, wow, the reason they feel that way, it must be something I did. I guess I didn't let them know how much I love them. I guess there's something I've withheld from them that they can't heal from this. You know, some people don't ever heal. And it's a choice. You ever, you ever see a kid picking a scab? And you tell them, don't do that. And they say, why? Because <laughs> you're going to make a scar. But worse than that, it doesn't get a chance to heal, does it? You keep messing with a wound, it won't heal. You keep remembering an infraction, you won't forgive or accept forgiveness. Isaiah 53 reminds us that Jesus, that he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we his, hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and he's car carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How many of you believe that? How many of you forget that? It's the problem. If Jesus died for you and forgave you of all your sins, why do you beat yourself up? Do you think it's helpful? You think maybe finally you'll stop doing that terrible thing that you do? Or that your tongue will suddenly be under complete control and you'll have some form of perfection or be able to measure up to somebody else that you really respect that's further down the road than you. There's unforgiveness here. And they're not accepting the forgiveness that's offered. Do you know that's, that's the only reason that people go to hell? Because they don't accept the forgiveness that's offered. They don't accept the free gift. They have to trample over the body of Jesus Christ to go to hell. So people say, well, how can a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. They do. And they have to trample over the body of Jesus Christ to do so. Shame and condemnation. Shame is, it's not something I did. This is who I am. I'm branded that way for the rest of my life. It's the stain that never comes out. My wife did a really great job yesterday in speaking about it to the ladies at the study. And we see it here. These guys still can't seem to wash the stain of what they've done off. Father's gone and now he's going to get us now. Dad's not here to protect us. He's probably still thinking about it. He's probably still mad. 
You ever wonder if somebody's still mad at you or, or unforgiving of you? And then you run into them and you say, hey, listen, I'm really sorry for that thing. And they go, what? <laughs> what thing? You know, that thing that happened a long time ago, you know, with... I, I don't even remember that, man. I'm, I'm, yeah, sure, no problem. And then you realize you've been carrying around something you don't need to carry. Any of you ever do that? Okay, good. Don't do that. <laughs> Jesus Christ came to take away the guilt of your sin and the punishment of your sin. Accept that. Receive it. Heal. But it's not going to keep... You're not going to get healing if you keep poking your finger in a scab. So what's in your backpack? You know, we, we can do such damage to people. Um, you disgust me. How can you live with yourself? Or the guy from Home Alone who says, look what you did, you little jerk. You know, we can do some real harm towards people, can't we? And some of us carry backpacks, and those backpacks will affect everything you do, everything you say, every relationship you have, and everywhere you go, and you'll wonder why you're so worn out and you're so tired, and it's because you're carrying something that only Jesus can carry. Human beings were never designed to carry shame. Can I get an Amen. Leave it at the cross. That's why he came. And we give it to our kids too, don't we? You're bad. Don't ever tell your kids or your grandkids they're bad. That's shame. What you did is wrong. Ah, that's the truth. You'll never amount to anything. And some of you have been told that. Some of you have been told some very damaging things. I'm telling you this morning, you should lay it at the cross and let it go. Jesus doesn't want you to carry it. In fact, you will not be able to carry it effectively. Like little kids going back to school, way too many books. Guilt and shame is something that we can deal with, and Jesus has made a way for us to ask forgiveness, offer repentance, and accept his forgiveness. And we walk on, and he makes us better. Amen? Amen. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. So they sent some messengers in, and as he goes away to cry, suddenly the brothers come, come in and they fall to the floor, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. So he does state the truth, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. He said it twice. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Joseph choked up on the bat and said, guys, I forgive you. It's a done deal. Yeah, you were wrong. I agree. But forget it. Let it go. God had an intention. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. How many things do you think that you've suffered in your life that you blame other people for that God's going to use? I can tell you what. God's using all sorts of harm that happened to me as a child. I mean, I grew up in a divorced home with a narcissistic mother and an abusive father and, you know, dealt drugs at an early age and became a criminal and wandered the streets and you go, oh my goodness, God must have just forgotten about you. No, he allowed me to go through things that I needed to go through because without going through those things, I'd have no compassion on anybody else that was in the same place. And I have a unique set of things that happened to me and I realized that God is using that for good and I wouldn't want to be somebody else. If you had everybody's faults and troubles and stuff put out on a table, you'd probably pick your own. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to that word, which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried 
and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. How many of you guys believe that? That is the essence of why we're here. That is the reason why we're here. It's the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I will never be good enough to get to heaven without Jesus Christ. None of us. So don't beat yourself up. Throw yourself in the mercy of God and be changed. Amen? Amen. Good. Verse 22. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. That's a good number. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. He saw his kids, kids, kids. And the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, he also brought up on Joseph's knees. On Joseph's knees. In other words, he was playing with them, you know. That's when they drool on you and bite you and all that. <laughs> and Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you. Notice the prophecy. God will visit you. Interesting. And you shall carry up my bones from here. And so Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. Interesting. And so that is the end. Hebrews 11 says this. These all died. It's the, the hall of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having, them, having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. One thing it says about all of these folks that have been before us that showed faith and held on to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that they saw the promises afar off. You and I get to read about how God fulfilled his word. We've got it easy. We don't have to look forward and wonder if God's going to do what he's going to do. We see what he's done, and we can trust that he's going to continue to do in Hebrews 11:22 the one thing that the writer of Hebrews brings out about Joseph out of all of his life out of 25% 13 chapters of the book of Genesis the one thing that's brought out in chapter 11 about him is by faith Joseph when he was dying made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones don't you find it interesting that that's the one thing that the writer of Hebrews picks out of all of Joseph's life and what made him a great man of faith because he prophesies, doesn't he? Just like his father did over the 12 tribes. So the book of Genesis starts with the creation of God that ends with the coffin. It starts with the glory of God creating. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it takes us from his glory all the way to the grave. We see the vastness of eternity in Genesis 1, and we see the shortness of time. In fact, Joseph's life, we get a 54-year jump from the previous verse, verse 21 to verse 22. And so we see in the beginning the living God who is and exists, and then we see a dead man at the very end. It's a very fitting end for the book of Genesis and so that is Genesis chapter 50, the burial of Jacob, the death of Joseph, and the end of Genesis after one year and two months. Next week, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. I know, the New Testament. Yes. So we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, and we'll go through a chapter at a time. So uh, by all means, come back, because everything that we just read about in Genesis, much of it's going to be looked at from a completely different direction in the New Testament.